Well, good day, everyone. I welcome you to this public session of the Owens Lake Scientific Advisory Panel. I'm Dave Allen, the panel chair. The panel's work is being conducted under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences in response to a request from the Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Now, the panel's been asked to evaluate the effectiveness of alternative dust control methods for their degree of reducing particulate matter emissions from the Owens Lake bed and reducing the use of water in controlling these emissions. Today, the panel will hear a presentation that is relevant to its task. I would like to emphasize to everyone that this is an information gathering session and that the panel has not completed its deliberations. Comments made by individuals, including members of the panel, should not be interpreted as positions of the panel or of the National Academy of Sciences. Once the panel's draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous peer review process before the draft is considered an NAS report. Therefore, observers who draw conclusions about the panel's work based on today's discussions will be doing so prematurely. I want to note that this entire session is on the record and is being recorded. The presenter will be asked to provide remarks and then the panel members will have the opportunity for follow-up discussion. However, because of time limitations, the panel and presenter should not be expected to entertain questions from members of the public. Anyone who wishes to submit written comments or other materials that are relevant to our charge should contact Ray Wassel, the responsible staff officer at the academies for this study. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to ask the other panel members to introduce themselves to the audience uh, and indicate their affiliations. And um, why don't we go through uh, the panel members and uh, Rita, uh, well, let's just have people um, uh, uh, introduce themselves as they hear a window of opportunity. Uh, so could we have the panel members introduce themselves, please? Good afternoon, this is Scott Tyler from the University of Nevada, Reno. I'm a hydrologist. Greg Oaken from uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Scott Campbell with the USDA Agriculture Research Service. Nisha Jami, Stanford University. Roya Barini, University of California at Riverside. Hi, Pratim Biswas, Washington University in St. Louis. Valerie Ebner, University of California at Davis. Akula Venkatram from University of California, Riverside. Okay, thank you, panel members. Our speaker today is Dr. Saeed Jora from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power's Eastern Sierra Environmental Group. The topic of his presentation is the hydrology of the Owens Valley and Owens Lake and the effects of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So we'll ask Dr. Jora to take no more than about 30 minutes for his presentation and then we'll have questions from the panel members. So Dr. Jora, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Saeed Jorad. I'm with the Eastern Sierra Environmental Group of LADWP. Uh, our group basically deals with the hydrology issues in the Eastern Sierra plus the water right issues uh, that uh, for all the properties that the, the city has in the Eastern Sierra and the water rights to be able to divert water from Eastern Sierra down to the city for municipal purposes. So this presentation basically to address a few uh, requests by the panel. They, what I got from Adam was the basic hydrologic facts of the basin, uh, climate and hydrology data for Owens Lake, uh, water budget, anticipated impact of uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. With that, I mean, we'll start with basically, again, I wasn't sure uh, where the panel is coming from. It looks like we have lots of uh, members from California, so you should be by and large familiar with the area. But what I'm going to go through, uh, assuming that you are not that familiar with the area. So Owens Valley, 
is located basically in the eastern side, eastern central side of uh, the the state, and uh, location-wise, uh, uh, the northern part is located in Mono County, and the southern part is located in in Inyo County. This is a relatively, uh, I mean, to start with, many of the uh, many of the slides that you will see here coming out of uh, USGS reports or the reports that were prepared by our by our consultants. Also, uh, the data used by and large, I mean, is either DWP, USGS, or also a great base in data that has been collected. So that's just to give a qualifier on the information that we will present. Uh, so the basin is about. Uh, uh, 2,600 square mile, and uh, bound by Mono Basin to the north, uh, White Mountains and Inyo Mountain on the east side, and the Sierra Mountains on the west side, and to the south we have Rose Valley. The city of Los Angeles owns about 315,000 acres of land, mostly within the valley floor of the basin. So uh, this is slide, the reason I'm, I have this slide is to show basically that water in oil resource in the valley basically comes from the snowfall along the Eastern Sierra Mountains. And what we have is a, a number of snow pillows throughout the mountain that measures how much snowfall we get. And from the snowfall, as you may see, there are many creeks that flow off of the mountain to the valley floor. Uh, there are over 40 creeks that flow off of Eastern Sierra Mountain to the valley floor, just a handful of creeks on the east side from White Mountain, and not much of any, any runoff off of the, off of in a mountain in the south where we are near Owens Lake. Uh, uh, Owens River starts from north uh, headwaters of the basin and all the way down flows and ends up in Owens Lake. So one of the one of the snow pillows that we use to measure uh, snowfall is in Mammoth Creek. And on Mount Creek, uh, we have uh, the amount of snow is clearly related, uh, correlated to the runoff that we calculate from the mountain. On the average, a snowfall in Mount Creek is about 42 inches uh, water content of the water uh, from the from the measurements that we collect. That's a measurement in April 1 of each year that is measured. And as you see, there is clear variation in a snowfall. For example, what you see in, in 2016, we had less than two inches of a snowfall. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I think the screen is dead for some reason. Oh, is it? it can, can others see um, Saeed's screen? Uh, no, I, I, um, yeah. Looks like I we're going to find here. That's strange. Um, I, I just lost it as well. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's fine here. It shows it. So let's go out of here, maybe. And yeah, are we connected? Let's try the share, share screen. again. Share. The green button. This one and share again. It's okay to see the system direct launch. I think you're connected to Zoom, uh, but we're seeing the Zoom screen on uh, okay. our screen okay. now. It took a while, okay. yeah. And now we have it back again. Oh, okay. Okay, good. 
So, so what? Uh, let's go back then. I mean, I th I'm not sure where was the last screen that everybody saw. So, so I think we, I was talking about mammoth, uh, mammoth pass snow pillow, and the variations that we see from year to year. Yes, I mean, 2016 we experienced the 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 lowest snowfall in the period of record, and then followed by a year in 2017 with one of the highest, the second highest snowfall. So what I want to show is basically the big variations you see from year to year. So the runoff from the snowfall for the valley is an average of 405,000 acre feet per year. And that's the average for the previous 50 years of runoff. And again, you see periods of drought followed by a few years of uh, wet years. Uh, late 80s, early 90s, we had the, one of the longest droughts. It was a six-year drought, which we experienced. Similarly, from 2012 to 2016, again, we experienced drought. But you can see repeatedly these uh, periods of droughts happening. Typically, for every a three to four year of good year, you see six to seven years of very dry conditions. Similar on the, as far as the precipitation on the valley floor, again, you see variations. These are a number of uh, gauges we have throughout valley. Bishop is toward the northern end of the valley, and then we come south, and uh, heavy is the southern end. Uh, on the average, we get about less than six inches of uh, rainfall on the valley floor. And the amount of uh, rainfall on the valley floor clearly correlates with the elevation where it's measured. So on the west side, typically, we see more uh, higher precipitation. On the, on, the, on the east side, typically, we see lower ones. As far as the, the geology of the uh, of the basin, uh, uh, obviously uh, Owens Valley is part of the Great Basin region. Uh, uh, what we see here, the and consolidated uh, granitic formations on the mountain side. Then you have alluvial fans, which are I mean these are I'm sorry consolidated granitic formations on the mountain side. You have unconsolidated formation on the alluvial fans, which is mixture of sand and gravel, coarse and fine material. And when you come to the valley floor, what you see basically is a fluvial formation, which are well-sorted layers of uh, sand, gravel, and clay. As far as the as far as the cross section of the valley, if you look north, what you will have is alluvial fans on the west side where, uh, where the recharge comes in and recharges both the shallow and the deep aquifer. These two aquifers are generally, when you get to valley floor, are separated by a, a layer of low conductivity, clay, silty material, that creates a, an artesian condition in the in the lower aquifer. Again, you looking from west toward going toward east, you typically encounter in your, uh, the Los Angeles aqueduct and then the Owens Valley Fault followed by Owens River. So the groundwater flow generally flows from north to south. I mean, this this map shows the the water level contours starting from north, this is Bishop area, and moving southward and heading toward Lone Pine and then Owens Lake. So Owens Lake basically gets some recharge coming from north uh, f as far as the groundwater flow goes. So LADWP has nine well fields throughout Owens Valley. I mean, starting from Laws, Bishop, going all the way down to Lone Pine. Obviously, at this point, we don't pump any groundwater from 
Owens Lake. So it's not a well field yet, even though we are looking in future to use part of the wire demand for that mitigation on Owens Lake from ground wire and their own lake. So, and that's a program that we are pursuing. We'll see where we end up with that. So out of the nine well fields, we have approximately 110 pumping wells throughout the valley. And on the average, we pump about 74,000 acre feet of water from these wells, from these wells throughout the well field. If you look at the amount of pumping that we have been doing throughout time, Generally, after the completion of the second barrel of uh, Los Angeles Aqueduct, we started uh, groundwater pumping. And you see that we have big variations. In some years, I mean, uh, we have really a small, and uh, other years, depending on the uh, availability of surface water, we were using groundwater. So, I mean, 70, 87, 88, we pumped nearly 200,000 acre feet. In, in 1991, LA and any other country entered into uh, an agreement to manage groundwater in Owens Valley. And as a result, you will, you'll see more stable type of uh, pumping over time. And that's the, uh, what we have been doing. And it um, looks like, I mean, the agreement kind of works to provide a stable uh, groundwater source that uh, would be available for uses both within Owens Valley and for export to the city. Now, where do we use the water for? That we have in both surface and groundwater. Of course, the lion's share of the water use is for irrigation. And now we use about 65,000 acre feet of water per year for that mitigation on Owens Lake. And there are other enhancement mitigation and obligations that we have throughout the valley uh, based on the city of um, the agreement between the city and and any county, for example, this lower portion is where we started rewatering the lower part of the river with water. So we need to maintain a, a minimum of 40 cfs of flow in the Owen River, river south of intake for the Los Angeles Aqueduct. So as a as a as a summary. And this basically gives a total, I mean, uh, summary of different uh, facts throughout uh, Owens Valley as a whole. And probably we went over most of all of these numbers, except the last one, which on the average, the city exports about 240,000 acre feet of water from Eastern Sierra for municipal uses in the city of Los Angeles. So coming down from uh, from Owens Valley and focusing more on Owens Lake, the lake, Owens Lake is basically located at the southern end of the valley. And again, you see a number of creeks that feed into the area. The biggest one being obviously Cottonwood. The other ones are there, but the, some of them are really small and historically they have been such a small amount of uh, water flowing that uh, they never they have never been measured i mean so we never installed gauges to actually measure so the flow out of these uh, creeks have been estimated to this time but now we are starting to install uh, gauges at the base of mountains to be able to measure how much uh, reach how much uh, runoff we get from the mountain side going to the next thing is that Looking, I mean, we looked at the the we looked at the, the snow pillow in Mammoth area. Here we also have a snow pillow on in Cottonwood in the mountain, and this graph basically shows the April one uh, water content of the snow pillows in the in the area compared to Mammoth that we saw the average. Uh, water content for mammoth was about 42 inches. Here we get about eight and a half inches over time. And again, we have, uh, this is one of the good uh, stations. We have data all the way back to 1940. And again, you see the variations from year to year. You have really wet years and you have poor years. This year actually ended up being a good year. When you go next week, you'll probably see more water than we typically see around Owen Valley. 
most of the creeks are flowing good. So this year, the runoff is about 138% of normal. Similarly, we have uh, gauges that measure rainfall. And uh, the reason I put these two just to portray the, the variations you see on the east and west side of uh, the lake. On the west side, the cottonwood gauge, which is located here, again, on the average gets about 6.6 uh, .6 inches of uh, precipitation annually. On the east side, uh, since I think 1997, Great Basin has started uh, a, a station that measures the, the precipitation, and the average that we have is about three inches. In Lone Pine, 3.8, again, down in down in uh, South Heavy, which is one of the reservoirs, regulatory reservoirs that the city uses for regulating flows out of the valley toward the city, is about 6.6 .6 inch. So again, th there are a few other uh, gauges that have been installed recently. We don't have, I mean, more than two, three years of data, so I just show them, but uh, the numbers were about in the same range that you see from from mostly from what you see in in Keeler. And again, I mean, the elevation on this side is higher, but generally I think being close to the mountain front on the west side, we get these higher uh, rainfalls. So unlike, I mean, uh, Owens Valley where uh, studies have been done for a long time and learned a lot more about the, the geology and hydrology, on Owens Lake, there is not, not as much information available. So in 2000, between 2009 and 2012, we started looking at a, a project, a, a Owens Lake Groundwater Evaluation Project. That to, uh, during that project, we installed a number of monitoring wells throughout the lake. I mean, and as you can see, DWP1 through DWP11, all to kind of cover the entire area. What we did at each location, we drilled a monitoring well or a borehole all the way to 1,500 feet deep, looked at the, geo the form formation, conducted the, the geophysical logs, and then completed the formation, the, the borehole as a monitoring well. We see, I mean, as you can see, there are at each of the locations, and probably you will see some of these next week when you visit the, uh, the lake, that you have a set of three cluster wells. And basically, they are completed at three different uh, aquifers. And throughout the lake, but itself, all of these, uh, uh, these uh, monitoring wells are in artesian conditions, so the head in the formation is higher the ground surface. In some of the wells, probably if you go by DWP9, the head in the deep in the in the deepest uh, uh, deepest monitoring well is 45 feet above ground surface. So you have a strong artesian condition. We had a definitely difficult time drilling these wells, especially because of the artesian conditions that we had. So at, uh, at each one of these uh, uh, locations, as the deepest well was being drilled, we were collecting a lithological formation, what kind of material we are getting out of it. And more usefully, we collected a uh, geophysical log and resistivity log, basically probably one of the more useful information you get out of it. High resistivity that we get is because of basically associated with the coarse material, that's gravels and sands, and low resistivities associated with fine material such as clays and silt. So with the information that we got, we basically determined that there are up to five aquifers at Owens Lake. So combining what we got from boreholes and borehole geophysics combined with the 
with the seismic surveys that were conducted by by Great Basin uh, Air Pollution Control District in 1990s, and I kind of forgot to uh, to talk about the resistivity survey that was conducted. These purple lines are different resistivity uh, the the seismic surveys that were conducted. So combining the data from seismic survey and the geophysical log, we came up with what the form what the aquifer condition is at Owens Lake. So uh, throughout the report, we basically have multiple cross sections. This is basically looking again north. You see five different aquifers with different thicknesses. They are separated by low per low permeability layers, which are basically clays as a result of sedimentation over time. And definitely these, are def these formations are the main groundwater system, which is separate from what you see just near the surface, which is really thin on the surface of the lake. The aquifer system itself is up to five uh, different layers of aquifer that exist in the area. The other things that we learned from, or basically improved the understanding, was the faulting system in the in the in the Owens Lake area, which definitely controlled the movement of groundwater. The two main faults that ran through the area is Owens River Fault and Owens Valley Fault. That Owens Valley Fault even extends all the way to the north, and you see uh, along the fault where lakes, small lakes or seeps that coming off of the fault side, the upper, the upside of the fault side that come out. To understand the exact uh, effectiveness of these faults in in controlling the groundwater movement, we obviously need to do pumping tests. We have started doing some of these pumping tests and we need to do to continue the pumping test to better understand to what degree they act as a barrier to the to the to the ground water flow. And that's really important because as I'm gonna talk a little bit later, these faults help provide water to the habitat around the lake. I mean to the spring and seep areas around the lake. So in order to be able to ensure if we ever do a pumping for that mitigation is not going to affect the, the springs and seeps and the habitat that depends on that. We need to better understand the, the characteristics of the, the faults on the lake. So thinking of about uh, thinking about the water budget for the lake, obviously we have the inflows and outflows. The fact that the basin is in, in a steady state condition, the inflows and outflows, obviously, they, are, they should balance out. So inflows to the, to the lake, the components of inflow to the lake include uh, recharge that we get from the north, from Lone Pine area, from streams along the Sierra mountain, the mountain block recharge, uh, interfluvial or fan recharge, just precipitation on the fan areas, down valley flow, and a small amount of recharge from uh, Inyo and the Koso range and Centennial Flat, which is to the southeast of the area. And finally, from south, we have heavy reservoir, which seepage from the, the reservoir is another source of inflow to the, to the system. The only outflows that we know is pumping, as far as pumping goes, is Crystal Geyser, which is located in the southwest area uh, corner of the the lake. I mean, you have probably seen and used uh, bottled water from Crystal Geyser. So they, they pump a small amount, something in the order of 350 acre feet a year. The other part is the uh, that we call it generally consumptive use is mainly mainly the evaporation and evapotranspiration from the area. So 
multiple pro multiple evaluations have been done to see what is the water balance of the area. Generally, they all range between 50 to, to 70,000 acre feet a year. Again, being the fact that the system at this point is in a steady state condition, the inflows and outflows should balance out. So different components of inflow, including down valley flows, mountain front, mountain front recharge, stream channels, a heavy reservoir, centennial flats. So the total of what the inflows are, and then the outflows, obviously, water that makes it to the brine pool evaporates, and that's, that's, a, that's a big component. The springs and seep areas around the, around the lake that I'm going to talk a little more about them later is the other component. And the small, again, domestic groundwater pumping that you have in Olancha, Chile, that's uh, the other component. And then recharge that comes uh, from the groundwater into the river itself further north, that's the, far, the last component. So, as I mentioned, as you go around the lake, and probably you will see them next week when you go, around the lake, one of the interesting components that you see is all these springs and seeps around the lake. So, and this is a, one of them in the south side that, I mean, looking nice, I mean, uh, like meadow area, but what you will see is water coming to the surface. It, there isn't, I mean, even though the, the source is groundwater, there is no well-defined spring eye that, okay, here is where the flow comes out and that's how you can measure it. So this is definitely hard to measure the amount that comes out of the ground and uh, supports all of these meadow springs and seep areas. The mechanism that we see, the way these springs and seeps are supplied is by the recharge from the mountain front coming through the alluvials and hits the lake bed material that cannot move laterally, so it ends up moving up to the surface. You also will see probably a few of these artesian wells that tap into the groundwater that is out there. But the main source of, uh, of, of water that seeps to the surface in the spring and seep areas is the recharge coming off of the mountain that cannot make it that far out into the lake bed itself, under the lake bed itself, so it has to come to the surface. I mean, some obviously make it, but there is enough that can support the spring and seep areas. So because we couldn't actually measure the, the flow using a flume, what comes out of it, what we did, we installed a number of monitoring wells at each site. I mean, for example, here we drilled three, moni I mean, three monitoring wells to different depths, one five foot, 10 foot, and 30 foot, and measured the head in these monitoring wells. So what we saw in all of the monitoring wells, uh, by the way, in some of the locations, Great Basin had already one or two monitoring wells there. So we went in and if there, if there was a 10-footer or a 3-footer, we added a 30-footer or vice versa. In any case, we ended up with uh, nine representative locations throughout the, the lake, uh, spring and seep areas that we could measure the difference in heads in these different three sets of cluster monitoring wells. What we see is that to, for all of these locations, the head or water level in the deep monitoring well was always higher than the shallower ones. So the red line in these hydrographs, so, so what you see here is basically three representative locations, one on the west side, one on the south side, and one on the east side. But in all of them, what you see is the head in the 30 footer is higher than the 10 and 5 footer. And, and again, similar situation. You see on the west side, these head differences are small because of the formation being more sandy. 
On the east side, you have more clay formations, so you get a lot bigger differential. So, and what we call it is the uh, groundwater gradient that supports, that causes the flow come to the surface and support the spring and seep area habitat that exists around the lake bed. So that basically is something that if we again go forward with the pumping of groundwater for that mitigation, we will use these differences as a control mechanism to make sure the spring seep area habitat is not impacted by groundwater pumping. For example, if these if the difference between the deep and the shallow levels, let's say it's 10, the way we are looking at, if we get, let's say 50% of that gradient reduction, then we will stop pumping. So we are still working on this project. We haven't completed the, the hydrologic monitoring management and mitigation plan that will clearly describe how the mechanism is gonna be, but these are some of the tools that we are going to be using in order to make sure the resources around the lake are not going to be impacted by groundwater pumping. So with that, the, the last piece that I should talk about is basically the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I suspect those of you from California are familiar with it. As you know, uh, uh, California has had uh, regulatory control over surface water from 1914. However, no control was on groundwater. You could pump as much groundwater for beneficial use as long as you don't impact the other pumpers in the area. However, in 2014, the state came up with Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And basically the goal is that to prevent undesirable effects. And the way they define and the undesirable and, and effects. And interestingly enough, I think it was important enough that they came up with these icons for each one of these effects. Lowering of groundwater levels, loss of storage, seawater intrusion, degraded quality of the water, lap, uh, land subsidence, and surface water depletion. So these were part of the act that came out in uh, 2014. So based on the uh, sigma, any an adjudicated uh, basin that is prioritized, I mean, basically all the basins are prioritized, uh, about over 500 basins we have in, 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 in California are either low, very low, low, medium, or high. And any basin that is categorized in medium or high, uh, then they have to develop, a, 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 they have to establish a groundwater sustainability agency that is responsible for developing the sustainability plan by 2022. And if they don't, they are subject to, to a state intervention. Now, how do, our, how do they prioritize different basins? They have eight different categories that they utilize to to categorize each one of the basins. I mean, population, population growth, the important ones being groundwater reliance and documented groundwater impact and other relevant uh, factors that they think is, I mean, a, a State Department of Water Resources thinks that's relevant. So in 2014, their prioritization categorized Owens Valley as medium. However, uh, their draft, of 2019 prioritization that came out in, in April uh, categorized Owens Valley as low. And as you can see, many other basins are, I mean, especially in Central Valley of California, uh, are categorized as, as, as high, a high priority. So we are expecting that by August, to have the final prioritization released by the Department of Water Resources, and we'll know if we will stay at low. I know there are a few protests to, the, uh, to this prioritization. It may stay low, it, it may go back to medium. But as of now, based on the draft, it's on low. With respect to Owens Valley, 
the county of uh, Inio and the county of Mono, city of Bishop, and uh, eight community service districts together they formed a, a sustainable groundwater sustainability agency and they are now working on a groundwater sustainability plan. Now, however, the city of Los Angeles lands in the Owens Valley is treated as adjudicated. That means it's not subject to sigma. And if you look at the map here, the hatched areas are all city of Los Angeles owned land. So they are not subject to sigma. However, Owens Lake, which is under the jurisdiction of state land, is not. So the Owens Valley Grammar Authority will have jurisdiction over uh, pumping from, from Owens Lake if we move forward and work on trying to get groundwater for dust mitigation. So the way they are looking at it, because as you saw from the map, the area are a bunch of little areas that when you, of the whole basin, if you take the city of Los Angeles out, then you have a small pieces around that the, the OVGA is going to be controlling. Among them is going to be Owens Lake. So, so Owens Lake will be considered as a management area within uh, Owens Valley Groundwater Basin. And uh, the, what we are working on now as part of Groundwater uh, Development Program, we believe will meet the requirements of any sustainability plan for the basin by Owens Valley Groundwater Authority. So that's where we are now. I mean, we'll have to wait and see what the priority is going to be, whether uh, Owens Valley Groundwater Authority will stay or dismantle if it comes out to stay low, because at that point they don't have to exist, but they may. In any case, that's where we are now. We'll know more as time goes on. And with that, I mean, basically, I'm done and I'm uh, here. I mean, uh, if you have any question, we'll be glad to discuss it. And if not, I will find the answer for you and uh, come back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's transition quickly uh, to panel questions and we'll handle panel questions in the way that we did yesterday, just having uh, panel members uh, uh, ask the questions directly rather than raising hands through uh, the Zoom system. So let me open it up to panel questions. Yeah, this is Scott Van Pelt, and um, I, I'm wondering which of the aquifers you have most of the wells bottomed into. Uh, in in you are talking in Owens Valley, right? Yes. Yeah, in Owens Valley, prior to the water agreement, I will go back to where I mean, so it's clear what we were talking about. Uh, prior to the water agreement, vegetation was not really a big issue. So the the goal was to maximize production. So wells were were screened both through the shallow and the deep aquifers. However, since water agreement, every well that we have drilled, which is not very many, but wells that we have replaced, I mean, because wells go out of commission. So any wells that we have drilled are screened in the deep aquifer. So we have minimum impact on water table, which supports vegetation on valley floor. Okay, thank you. Sure. Additional panel questions. Well, I'll go ahead and ask one then. Um, I, so I'm not a hydrologist, so, uh, but I noted that you uh, stated that a number of the seeps and the uh, groundwater uh, movement to the surface was influenced by earthquakes. And I wonder with the uh, recent uh, flurry of act, uh, earthquake activity in the immediate area, whether you'd seen any uh, substantial changes in uh, the seeps or the movement of the groundwater or pressures 
uh, in your various wells? Yeah, um, when if you look at these uh, on the panel on the left side, the red points are where we actually measure uh, water levels in those uh, cluster monitoring wells, uh, and they are all equipped with uh, a pressure transducer which continuously measure water level and unfortunately we I mean we haven't seen anything so far but we haven't downloaded data from the transducers yet so by the end of the month when we download the data and look at it we probably I suspect you'll see some changes in the in the water levels as a result of the earthquake because I mean they are continuously measuring water levels so as of now, I don't have much data to give you, but I mean, we should be able to, by the end of the month, when we download the data, to see what kind of changes we see in water, groundwater levels as a result of the recent uh, earthquakes, which I mean, 7.1 was high enough, basically. We should see and close enough to the area. Other panel questions? Uh, I saw a little quip that Scott Tyler wanted to be unmuted. I suspect he may have a question. Oh, okay. here we go. Uh, this is Scott Tyler. Thank you, whoever did that. Just a question on the uh, kind of aquifer chemistry and salinity. So, um, I know I just sent this out as a as a chat, so you can ignore that. But I assume that the springs are sort of in the relatively fresh couple hundred to a thousand TDS range, um, and your aquifers once you get below the surficial, uh, the playa aquifers are in the are in a few percent salinity. Can you can you give us a, a feedback on on water quality a little bit from some of these deeper wells? Actually, that's a good question. Maybe I should have added some on water quality, which. I missed, but in any case, you are right. I mean, because we get the uh, we get the recharge from the mountain front, fresh water coming down, the water quality in these spring and seep areas are really good, no problem there. But as you go down to the west, because there is not much recharge from this area, the quality degrades. And as you go down deeper, the quality really degrades. I mean, when you go down to, let's say, the over four or 500, then the TDS that would have been on the west side, something in the order of two, three, 400 uh, parts per million, comes down to about five to 10,000 parts per million. So the quality definitely degrades as you go deeper and especially as you go on the east side of the lake. Thank you. Sure. And, and just maybe just one more question. I know when, because I happened to be on the drilling rig when, when the OL92 core was, was drilled and, and, and a significant natural gas was, was uh, run into. Did you guys run into, into methane at all in any of your drilling? Yes, yes. I mean, that's interesting that you, you expect. So that OL92 is somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. And we have new wells in this area. And we, the most recent one that we drilled was in this location. And in both cases, we did encounter yeah, methane gas. You are right. Yeah, and that's a problem, especially on the south and southeast portion of the lake if you drill deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, indicative of pretty significant organic matter at depth somewhere. Okay. Right, right, right. And, and in the long run, it could actually be useful. I, at least I, it would be worthwhile at some point for someone to think about uh, that as a natural resource to help cover costs out here. Uh, it could be, it could be. Again, we are not, I think, going deep enough. You know, in, in, in OL92, you went really deep. I mean, several thousand feet. In our case, I mean, the deepest we go, we went, I mean, as far as those initial boreholes that we drilled was about 1,500 feet deep. And again, no problem with the boreholes we drilled in the north side, on the east side, no problem. 
the area we encountered problem was on the south and basically southwest side of the lake. But yeah, potentially somebody can, can think through how they can utilize that resource. Any final questions for Dr. Uh, yes, this yeah. is uh, Venki here. Uh, I'm not a hydrologist, so this is, might be a naive question. I notice you're using, you're using one third of the water that you're pumping out for mitigation. Uh, do you propose to use less than that? What are your plans for oh. water use? So you're talking about, I mean, the, the, pie pumping, chart yes. showed, the pie chart you showed suggested that you're using one third of the water, uh, approximately one third of the water that you're pumping out. Uh, the, the pie chart. Yeah, I think that's what. Uh, let me go back here. I yeah, think that's that's it. That's it. You just passed by. Okay, this one. No, not that one. Not one. There's a, there was a Sorry. pie chart. It shows how much water you. Oh, 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 okay. No, yeah. okay. I see, I see, I see what you are talking about. Yes. So this is this is this talks about the water use is not just groundwater use. You, I mean, I mentioned that we get about four hundred five thousand of acre feet of recharge from the uh, overall from Eastern Sierra. So not all of this water. I mean, not all of this water is basically groundwater. So. Okay. We oh, have ground. We have. We have. We have, we have. Okay. We have on the average seventy-four thousand acre feet of groundwater that we pump, and we have about on the average four four hundred five thousand acre feet of runoff. That these are the uses of water on the, in Owens Valley. It could come partly from surface water, partly from groundwater, but the total use of combined surface or groundwater in Owens Valley is about 168,000 acre feet. So what so, is the, so just to clarify if I, I mean, when you say Owens Lake is 65,000, what does that mean? That means for that mitigation, we have to divert. I mean, and again, you, next week you will see when you visit the area, we have to divert water from the aqueduct and use it for dust mitigation. So right now we are pumping zero amount from Owens Lake area. We pump ground water further north from the well fields to the north. But the water that goes to Owens Lake for dust mitigation, its entirety come from LA Aqueduct or what we call pump back station, the water that we diverted into the the river and then comes down south and at that point it can either go back to the aqueduct or go to Owens Lake for dust mitigation. So the water that you see, 65,000 average acre feet, acre feet on the average on the Owens Lake for dust mitigation does not come from groundwater. Okay, but is so just to be clear, if, if I could follow up, I was writing these numbers down as you were going through your slides. So I just want to be clear because uh, uh, the 405,000 average runoff then goes into two basic bins, one of which you're showing in this slide, as I understand it, which is 168,000 feet of Owens Valley uh, uses of which 65,000 is for the mitigation. And then you elsewhere in, the, in your slides, noted that the uh, shipment to Los Angeles uh, averages 240,000 acre feet. So the two, uh, my understanding then is the 240,000 acre feet plus the 168,000 acre feet is, uh, is equal to the total amount of runoff that you're getting. Is, is that a correct even, interpretation? No, that is generally correct. That's generally correct, even though there are other uses besides that other landowners that use, there are, I mean, for example, you have the city of Bishop that uses groundwater for pumping. We have Big Pine, we have Lone Pine, we have Independence, plus there are a number of private landowners throughout that use water for that mitigation, for, for irrigation. So overall, yeah, generally you are right. Of the water that gets run off, off of the mountain, 
partly is exported to the city. The rest is used on the, uh, within Owens Valley for various uses. And again, the two main ones, the lion shares go for Irian, for Owens Lake dust mitigation or for irrigation uh, that we have committed part of INEO LA water agreement to continue irrigating uh, in the area. All right, can I ask you a question before we have to show, this is Musha and I've been struggling with muting and unmuting for the whole entire time. Um, so can you actually talk a little bit about, I mean, this conversation is very interesting. Two things, one, I'm very interested to know as water, as it sort of, you have wet years and dry years, we had this conversation in Los Angeles, when you have extra water, they mentioned that they, you try to send it, sort of prevent it from going to the valley just because of the infrastructure that's there. So I'm very interested to see how that water is managed. The second thing is, um, do you guys do any recharge uh, in the area? And then you mentioned there's irrigation going on for the city of Bishop and uh, for, uh, some of the landowners in the area. What is the magnitude of that irrigation? Is it you know, compared to what gets transported down to Los Angeles. Okay, so let's start with your first question, that how is water managed in, in, in a year, in a big year, like let's say 2017 or this year, 2019? Um, you know, 1969 was a, was a really big year, it was probably the biggest year in the period of record. We have lots, of, we had lots of water. So, all the extra water made it to Owens Lake and then evaporated, right? However, now because of all of the infrastructure we have uh, for dust mitigation on Owens Lake that you will see next week, uh, we have to prevent water to go to Owens Lake. So what we do, we basically try to spread water on the alluvial fans, which will recharge uh, the the groundwater basin, right? And uh, in 2017, we ended up having to release some water down from the aqueduct on the area that we weren't intending to release. So that's what happens uh, because of the because of uh, the amount of water we have. The converse of that is that I mean, in in the drought years, like the year before. 2017, which was uh, the year that we had very low runoff, we ended up taking basically zero water to the city. So when you have sustained droughts like 2012, 2016, we will have to lower the amount that we can export to, you know, in order, because we have commitments in the city, in the valley that we have to meet. Like you see in the in this pie chart that we have to provide water for various uses in the valley. So that comes first and export to the city is the secondary. So when there is drought, especially when we have sustained droughts, like, I mean, in 2015, then we end up not exporting water, which means obviously the city still needs water. People need to drink. We have. 4 million population in the city that needs to have drinking water. That means the water has to come either from uh, Sacramento Delta area or from, uh, from Colorado aqueduct. So those are the alternative ways that we have to supply the city when we don't have enough water from LA aqueduct. And that's basically the reality of the life that we have to deal with and manage the water that we have for for different purposes that are committed to, basically based on agreements that we have, especially the 1991 INEO Los Angeles Water Agreement. Uh, please repeat the other questions so I can go over those. So you sort of answered, so you, do, you guys do recharge, try to recharge the groundwater when you have a big year. And then I was wondering how, what's the percentage of the water that's used for Bishop and uh, the agriculture areas in the in that region, because you just uh, mentioned some of that water is used by the locals. Right. Yeah. I mean, th th again, a small amount. In many cases, we really don't have any data. But the irrigation water, some of it is covered uh, covered by what you see here, the fifty thousand. 
those are on city owned land. The other land owners, we really don't have good data. We are working to get more detailed data using like satellite imagery to look at how much the how much different irrig uh, irrigated areas use. We are still in the process of completing that study. But yeah, the, the, the city of Bishop, uh, Big Pine, uh, Independence, uh, the tribes, the tribes, uh, for example, I mean, the tribes, I can tell you exactly, they have, uh, we have uh, tribes in each one of the, uh, the towns in the Owens Valley. We have Bishop, Big Pine, Independence and Lone Pine, they all have uh, reservations. They use 5,600 acre feet of water, I mean, every year. I mean, that's their allocation that they, they can use any way they want. So we have some of those numbers, but we can also estimate for modeling purposes, I mean, what other uses are, but generally a small amounts. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any final questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Jorat for uh, his presentation and also all of his responses. Uh, I recognize that we may develop additional questions as the panel continues its work. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their participation in today's open meeting. And I will remind before we adjourn the panel members that we have a closed session that will uh, necessitate you dialing into a different Zoom line in uh, just a moment. Uh, let me turn to Ray and see if there are any uh, closing administrative comments he needs to make. Uh, this is Ray. Uh, no, I have no uh, additional comments other than to uh, to thank our presenter for uh, a great presentation and, and uh, thank everybody for uh, uh, participating on the call. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, panel, we will uh, reconvene as soon as you can join the other conference line. Okay.